Hello, stats friends. I hope you're having an awesome day. Uh, today we're going to go on to 832, which is all about confidence intervals, but when you don't know anything about the true standard deviation of the population, which is a much more realistic occurrence. So, we have a lot of new stuff to cover today. Confidence intervals are all still the same thing, um, but when sigma is unknown, there's a lot more that you have to kind of deal with. So we're going to go over all that stuff and don't worry we'll go over stuff in class too so don't panic. Okay so we're going to be constructing interpreting confidence intervals when sigma is unknown. We're going to understand what the t distribution is. So we're, we're used to the z distribution um, and now we're introducing a new thing called the t distribution. Uh, you're going to find out what degrees of freedom are and um, what it means to use a t procedure in a more wise way. All right, so here's the dilemma. When sigma is unknown, the only thing you have to estimate um, the standard deviation is S of X. But the problem is the sample, um, the sample standard deviation is generally really far away from the true standard deviation of the population. So um, and that kind of depends on what n is. If n is really small, s is generally really far away from sigma, and as n gets larger, as the sample size gets larger, then your standard deviation will get closer and closer to the true standard deviation of the population. So um, we're going to actually look at, uh, we're going to compare two distributions. So the one at the top here um, is the new distribution. The one that we're used to um, is the bottom, which is the z distribution, right? Where its mean is at zero, right? And its standard deviation is one. Um, and all of your data is, it doesn't vary much, right? Most of the data lies within two standard deviations of the mean, right? Empirical rule 95% of the data lies within two standard deviations of the mean. Now, when we're actually using s sub x instead of sigma, um, we have a different scenario. And if you take a look at the shape of the top distribution, it's significantly more spread out. Okay, it's pulled like that, right? So um, basically what we have to do is we have to account for the, the higher amount of variability. And so basically what a t distribution does is it gives us more wiggle room to play with. Um, you're less confident um, and your confidence intervals are going to be larger. Um, so that's kind of like the general gist of the t-distribution. Interesting fact, the guy who came up with the t-distribution was a Guinness brewer. Um, his name was William Gossett and he actually came up with this distribution to help um, the, the brewing company that he was working for and it worked and he was really popular in the company so yay good stuff alright so uh, degrees of freedom the concept is a little confusing um, but generally what you have to know for this type of a situation for the t-distribution is that you calculate your degrees of freedom by um, subtracting one from the whatever your sample size is. So if your sample size is 30, your degrees of freedom is 29. Okay, so it's not that hard to calculate, um, but basically um, degrees of freedom is basically the number of um, values in your final calculation that are free to vary, um, which doesn't really make a whole lot of sense right now, um, but because right now we are estimating one parameter, we subtract n minus one. And later we'll be estimating two parameters, and so we're gonna subtract n minus two. Um, but so at this point we have one variable that's free to vary, therefore our degrees of freedom is n minus one. Okay, so here's kind of the weird part. Every single, um, for every single different degree of freedom that you have, the curve is different because as sample size increases, your variability will decrease, right? Your standard deviation decreases. And so if you take a look um, at the curve, the red dotted line 
has the most variability, right? It has the most area and room under the tails. And um, it's kind of, I mean, it's, it's much more spread out than the other ones. And that's because it's a much smaller um, sample size. That's a sample size of three, which means degrees of freedom two. Okay, the next one with a little less variability is the turquoise-ish one. Um, and that one is a sample size of 10, or degrees of freedom 9. Um, and so as you see, you know, the, the shape of the distribution is just, it's starting to kind of squish in a little bit, right, and push up. So it's starting to look closer to a normal distribution, um, but isn't quite. And last but not least is the purple, and the purple is the standard normal curve, right, um, which just plots all the z-scores. Um, which includes sigma, not s, right? And so that one is kind of our goal. And if we have a larger sample size, the closer and closer the t distribution gets to the normal distribution, OK? OK, moving on. Um, so this is just kind of the official definition of the t distribution, OK? Um, so the statistic, remember statistic comes from a sample. So our statistic. Um, t, which I'll write down in a second, um, has a t distribution with degrees of freedom n minus 1. Um, and this statistic will have approximately a n minus 1 distribution as long as the sampling distribution of x bar is approximately normal. Now there's like a bajillion exclamation points because this part is like super important. Ah! Okay, um, so you, we have to make sure that the sampling distribution is approximately normal. Um, okay. Okay, so our tests for normality have always been, like, that n is greater than or equal to 30, right? So generally, n is greater than or equal to 30, right? And so if that's the case, then you're fine using the t distribution, okay? Not a problem. You don't know sigma, so you approximate it using s of x, and n is greater than or equal to 30. You just go to the t distribution chart, use the values there, which I'll show you how to do later. Okay, so that is, you're happy. Good scenario. You don't have to do any extra work. Okay, pauses as you see fit, um, but this stuff is super crucial in order to make confidence intervals and later do hypothesis tests, so really gotta make sure that you got these conditions, okay? So our next best scenario is that our sample size is between 15 and 30, okay? The ends are kind of wiggly-ish, right? They're, eh, you know, less than or equal to 30, less, you know, greater than or equal to 15-ish, right? Um, if the sample distribution appears to be um, somewhat normal-ish, um, uh, it's usually it's okay to use the t distribution as long as you don't have extreme outliers um, or extreme and strong skewness um, in the sample distribution. Okay, and so at this point, if your n is less than 30, what you have to do is you have to graph the sample distribution, um, the sample that you have, and actually like plug in the numbers into your calculator and then plot either a normal probability plot, um, a box plot, histogram, whatever you need in order to say, oh, that looks, um, you know, somewhat symmetric, um, there's no extreme outliers, there's not any extreme skewness, and therefore we can continue to use the t-distribution. Yay! If you see a lot of skewness or extreme outliers, then you can't use it. Although you still have to say that you can't use it and you have to do it anyways because it's the AP exam. <laughs> and they're not going to just say you're not allowed to do anything and you get out of doing all the work. That would never happen. So anyways, n is between 15 and 30. OK, if n is less than 15 and the data appears to be pretty symmetric, um, not skewed at all, no outliers, looks pretty nice to normal-ish, um, then you can still use the t-distributions. If you see um, skewness or outliers, um, you're not allowed to use t. 
and the first two conditions have stars next to them because you have to do more work if that's the scenario. If your sample size is less than 30, you have to draw a diagram. Either a normal probability plot, a box plot, or um, a histogram of sorts. And you can actually just do it in your calculator and then sketch what you see on, um, on your test or on your homework or whatever. Um, and then you should be fine. So I'm going to write that down for you. And um, just as a refresher, the normal probability plot, that's the one where you're plotting like the point versus the points versus what their z-score would be if the data were normal. And so you're looking for a linear trend on a normal probability plot. On a box plot histogram, you're just looking for um, symmetric, no skewness, no outliers. All right, so there's the chunk of the t-distribution. Um, making confidence intervals with them is super easy. Um, you are still doing, you're still estimating mu, right? This is still quantitative data. And so your statistic is x bar. Your critical value, that comes from the t distribution instead of the z distribution. And that's the only thing that's like super different. So I'll show you how to do that. Okay, here are two examples. The first one is just figuring out what t would be. Um, and for certain uh, confidence levels. And then example two is actually doing the process. Um, so I would actually pause the video right now, try these on your own first, and then um, keep going, okay? All right, so here's the tricky thing about the T distribution. Um, usually with the Z distribution, we're used to um, the percentages corresponding to the um, percent below Okay, um, below a certain z value. So like if I found the z value, the, the percentages that are inside this table correspond to the, the area below. Um, in the t distribution, it's the area above, which you can see on this, um, on this diagram here, just as a reminder. But anyway, so the way you use it, so for, um, on our first example, we're looking for a 95% confidence interval and our degree, or n, our sample size is 21, which means our degrees of freedom is 20. And what we're looking for is, okay, what is the, the area um, on the end so that we can find our t value, okay? If I want a 95% confidence interval, that means I have 5% on the two sides together, which means 2.5% on this tail, okay? So I'm looking for... 2.5 percent on my um, on my tail probability here so I'm looking at this column and then I'm looking for my 20 uh, degrees of freedom so I go down to 20 degrees of freedom and my t value my t star is 2.086 so I'll do the same thing for the rest of the problems and then move on you should try it on your own and check your answers sorry real quick one thing to notice on the t table is that as your degrees of freedom um, increase, right, that proportion gets um, closer and closer, uh, it gets smaller and smaller, right, and so um, whatever your t value is. And <clears throat> if you look down here, if your sample size is infinity, those numbers at the bottom, those should start looking familiar to you. Those are actually like this 1.96, that's a confidence level of 95%. Um, so you could also look at that as well. Um, 1.96, that's the z-score that corresponds to a 95% confidence interval, a confidence level. And so that, this last row here, when n is infinity, that is, um, those are your z-scores um, that you would use for a confidence interval. So just wanted to show you that. Um, and then here are your solutions. Um, and you can check your answers. And then I'm going to run through the second example. I'm not going to have a lot of time to explain it, so I'll just make sure I write down the solution really well. Okay, so here is the solution for the last problem. Um, it wasn't an ideal problem because we didn't actually have uh, data points to graph, um, but it'll at least show you the process. So uh, we'll do more examples in class. Good luck! Bye!